So this week we're going to talk about evolution and specifically about adaptationism, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, I think evolution is a really interesting topic in thinking about science and values. So most of this lecture and the next lecture are going to be drawn from Elizabeth Lloyd's book, uh, The Case of the Female Orgasm, Bias and the Science of Evolution. And she's going to argue that our values and essentially our ideologies are negatively influencing the science of evolution. So she's going to do this project of trying to unearth some assumed values and by unearthing them, hopefully get them out of the science and we'll have a clearer view of our evolutionary history. Um, before I get into that, though, I want to briefly consider the other direction. So maybe the science can tell us something about what we should value. So when we're thinking about what kind of beings we are, evolution is a particularly interesting subject because, you know, if you want to know what you should do, it's probably a good idea to figure out what kind of being you are first. And, uh, you know, what kind of being you are is in some sense shaped by evolution, at least some broad sense. Um, so let's, let's talk about trying to figure out what kind of things we are based on our evolutionary history. Now, uh, if you recall from last week, Richard Lewinton uh, criticized the idea that things are just sort of hardwired into our nature. Let's imagine that we hadn't heard that conversation and think about maybe uh, trying to use our evolutionary past to figure out in, in what sense things might be hardwired into us. So if you want to know what kind of animals humans are, you might look at our closest relatives and think, you know, if something is shared amongst our closest relatives, maybe it's baked into us. Maybe it's in our genes in some sense. So somewhere between five and seven million years ago, humans diverged from two other groups, uh, bonobos and chimpanzees, uh, and we're about equally related to those two. So it's tempting to think that if something is common between these three groups, then it's in our genes. So... I don't think that's completely wrong. I mean, there are shared genes between these groups and there's some stuff that just seems to be in your genes, like the fact that you breathe oxygen rather than carbon dioxide. I think that's probably sort of written into your genetic code. But for the stuff that we mostly care about, for the stuff that we're mostly thinking about, I think it's profoundly difficult to um, sort of find something that's uh, just written into our genes as demonstrated by our evolutionarily closest relatives. So... Uh, let's look at chimps first. I mean, chimpanzees are like us in a lot of ways. They're, they're highly social, they're curious, they're intelligent. Uh, chimps have been observed using tools like stones to crack nuts or using little sticks to kind of fish for termites or ants. Um, so they're not completely dissimilar to us. In one of the possible similarities is that, uh, chimpanzees are, are kind of the jerks. Um, their, uh, society is intensely patriarchal. And by that, I mean, it's, it's heavily male dominated. Uh, that domination is maintained through sort of violence or male, male violence and male, female violence. Uh, males will regularly beat each other up for the right to mate with females, a question about which the female doesn't really have all that much choice. Uh, the males are substantially larger. Um, and chimpanzees have been... I mean, they've been known to engage in what you might call intertribal warfare, like different groups of chimpanzees sort of fighting each other. Um, horribly, male chimpanzees have been known to pretty regularly kill and eat the infants of uh, a female that they've recently mated with. Uh, so baby cannibalism. Um, okay, so chimps, they're uh, our closest relatives and they're pretty awful. Um, a lot of the time. I mean, they're nice enough, but like, um, you certainly wouldn't want to live with chimps. Uh, you wouldn't want to live in a chimpanzee society, I would suggest. Uh, but compare that to bonobos, our other equally close relative. Um, so bonobo society is by no means 100% peaceful, but it's substantially more peaceful than chimpanzee society. Uh, bonobo society is largely female dominated. Um, there's much less violence within groups. Uh, and that seems to be maintained by coalitions of females. So in chimpanzee dominance hierarchies, it's pretty much always the largest male that's sort of top of the hierarchy. Whereas in bonobo society, um, typically it's the oldest females get to be at the top of the hierarchy. And in the lower ranks, sort of males and females can be equally ranked. Um, so rather than 
sort of holding their social organization together by violence. Bonobos are famous for um, using sort of sex and intimate touch. So they do groom, uh, chimpanzees will do grooming as well, but bonobos will sort of like sexually touch each other to maintain relationships or uh, to smooth over tensions. Uh, this is both uh, heterosexual and homosexual touching. They're, they are very sexy apes there in the sense of that they do a lot of it. Um, so if chimpanzees are our brutal patriarchal evolutionary cousins, chimpanzees are our free love, uh, peace and uh, matriarchy closest cousins. So if you're trying to take a look at sort of like our recent past and determine what kind of society is intrinsic to humans, I think that you see a really wide spectrum in our closest relatives. So if you look at our closest relatives, you see um, not exactly polar opposites, but like really huge differences, which suggests to me that this dream of like, you know, maybe we can just look at evolution and it'll tell us what kind of things we are, uh, is probably not going to work out. That's, that's a, it's a, um, just based on the data of our, literally our closest relatives, I think that you can't sort of read off of our history what kind of beings we are or what kind of society we, we are stuck with. So, yeah. So we'll come back to this when we talk about human nature, but I thought I'd just sort of prime the pump in terms of thinking about evolution with that, with that uh, thought. Okay. So turning now to the other sort of side of this question of you know, are our values influencing science? And this is the topic of Elizabeth Lloyd's book. So she looks at, in this book, uh, she looks at 21 separate uh, evolutionary accounts of the female orgasm in humans. And she finds that they are all terrible, all 21 of them. Uh, and in the pattern of errors that they make, she argues, we can identify two main biases. Uh, androcentrism and adaptationism. Okay. Lloyd thinks that we're just too quick to call things adaptive, that we're too quick to attribute to some feature of our bodies or our brains or our genes or whatever, um, the feature of having been selected for some particular purpose. She thinks that the image of our bodies as a kind of mechanical product of our genes is deeply outdated and that we should only call something an adaptation under some pretty specific circumstances. So adaptationism, she's identifying this as a kind of bias, and the bias that she thinks that it represents is uh, over-attribution of purpose to features of our bodies. So, um, now that's not to say that she's against calling something an adaptation. She thinks there are good conditions under which you might call something adaptive. So here's her example. Here's an example of what she thinks with a really good evolutionary or natural selection explanation looks like. Uh, and it's the, um, it's the major histocompatibility genes. I swear this image is relevant. Okay. So, um, major histocompatibility genes are the genes that help write your immune system, right? So these genes that tell your immune system that, uh, get it going. Now, of course it changes over your lifetime, but the major histocompatibility genes uh, help to kind of underwrite it from birth. Okay, so we know what those genes are. So we know about the genetic basis of this trait. You know, features of my immune system are writ coded for by the genes that are uh, the major major histocompatibility genes. Okay, now uh, when you're uh, looking for a somebody to mate with, uh, you probably want them to have different major histocompatibility genes than you do, right? So if you got two copies of the exact same uh, major histocompatibility genes, then you don't get as broad a range of potential immunity as if the other person has different uh, MHC genes, major histocompatibility genes. Okay, so that's a pretty clear story about why it would be adaptive, why it would be helpful for your offspring to have different genes than you do, okay? Uh, now, that makes it clearly related to fitness. Surviving illness makes you more likely to be fit in the sense of like living long enough to have kids who have kids. And furthermore, it's demonstrably related to 
mate preferences. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, now we're getting around to this somewhat horrible uh, image. So there was a scientific study done on trying to, trying to identify whether people could tell by smell whether somebody had the same major histocompatibility genes as they do. So they had a bunch of men put on a t-shirt and then do some exercise and sort of sweat into their t-shirts. And then they boxed those t-shirts up and had a group of women smell each of the t-shirts and what they and then rate how attractive the smell was. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and then they did sort of genetic sequences for the MHC uh, genes in both of those groups of people. And what they found was when uh, the man had different MHC genes than the woman, she rated his smell as more attractive, right? They, they just smelled better to her. Okay, so uh, the point of this study is to show that uh, people in a modern day actual context can distinguish when somebody, well, they don't have the thought presumably, ah, this person has different MHC genes than I do. But they do have a kind of way of telling in the sense of they find the smell of a person more attractive if they've got different MHC genes than you do. So what this ticks off is a number of important boxes. We know the genetic basis of this trait, right? We know which genes code for it. Uh, we know how those genes are related to fitness. And we know how that, uh, those genes would affect mate preferences. So the people actually respond to differences in these genes rather than it being invisible to them. So Lloyd thinks this is a really good evolutionary story, right? A really good story about how MHC genes have been selected for a specific thing, which is to give you a broad range of immunity from birth. So that's, that's what it looks like when it goes well. Let's look at what it goes maybe less well. Um, okay, so this is a, a study from 2012. Uh, called Calories, Beauty, and Ovulation, the Effects of the Menstrual Cycle on Food and Appearance-Related Consumption. Uh, this, this isn't one of Lloyd's examples. This is one that I pulled uh, years ago, just sort of browsing the evolutionary psychology literature. Um, so uh, it's a, this is a study, it's a survey study, trying to correlate women's, the, the point at which they're in in their menstrual cycles with their consumer behavior. So whether they buy food or whether they buy clothing. Um, so they did two survey studies uh, lasting a total of 35 days. So like a little bit more than one menstrual cycle. Um, and their sample sizes were 35 and 17 women. Um, okay, so they found that, uh, I think they found that uh, uh, as you can see here, women spent slightly more money on food when they're in their luteal phase and slightly more on clothing when they're in their fertile phase. And the paper goes on to say, ah, this is clearly an adaptation. This is clearly uh, something that women are doing because this is going to affect their uh, likelihood of uh, reproducing. Um, they do not discuss the genetic basis for this. Uh, they do not attempt to replicate it cross-culturally. Um, they do not attempt to make a clear connection between these behaviors and the fitness of the woman. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So I would suggest that this is a less good example of trying to explain things in evolutionary terms. That is, they haven't really done the work that's necessary. So in the in the major histocompatibility genes story, we know which genes they are, we know how people detect those genes, we know how those genes affect fitness. And here, not so much. Um, so you think I think that you see a lot more of this kind of telling an adaptive story that sounds sort of plausible. So in here, the adaptive story is supposed to be something like uh, in the fertile phase, women are trying to make themselves look more attractive. And then in the luteal phase, they are trying to eat. Um, it's really not a super tight story. So uh, this is the kind of thing that Elizabeth Lloyd is trying to get us out of, like telling evolutionary stories without really doing the legwork to back them up with clear genetic evidence or the kind of uh, the, the sort of precise uh, mechanism by which 
the genes affect behavior and how behavior affects uh, fertility or uh, fitness or whatever. Okay. All right. So she sets out some, let's say, minimum standards for something to be a worthwhile evolutionary explanation. Uh, first of all, your explanation should fit the data as it exists. Now, that sounds super trivial, but a bunch of the explanations for the evolution of the female orgasm are going to turn out to not satisfy this, this criterion. Uh, your explanation should be coherent, same, same. Uh, there should be some an evidence for a genetic basis for the trait. Also seems super reasonable, right? And uh, the explanation should connect the trait to increased fitness. So these are really low standards. These are, these are not uh, pie in the sky like, you know, I need to know the complete history of all of your ancestors back for time immemorial. These are just sort of basic standards for something to be a worthwhile evolutionary explanation. And what she's going to find is the, the explanations in the literature fail to meet one or more of these standards. And she really thinks it's worth asking why. Why is it that the literature could have so many really just genuinely terrible explanations? Why did people put up with this? How did this stuff get published? So uh, she's going to argue that... Uh, the reason why people got away with these very bad explanations was androcentrism and adaptationism, both of which are kind of ideological blinders that prevented people from really looking critically enough at the stories that were being published. So uh, that'll be the topic for the next video. Mm. Uh, before we get there, I think it's worth going briefly over this question, which I, I've given this lecture a few times and students uh, very often have this question. So if this is on your mind, this is for you. Uh, do we, is this something that we need an explanation for? So why are people even trying to explain this thing? Um, so one reason why people are looking for an explanation for the presence of the female orgasm uh, could be just plain old adaptationism. That is the assumption that if something's there in your body or in your reflexes or in your uh, genes, there must be an adaptive reason for it. Uh, ultimately, Lloyd's going to reject the idea that there is a kind of something that the female orgasm has been selected for. So she's going to reject the assumption that we actually need to come up with an explanation for this. So it's a uh, her ultimate answer to this question is, well, we don't need to explain these. These are, in some sense, a feature of human bodies, but not something that they were selected for. Um, yeah. So if something's bothering you about this question, maybe it's the assumption built in, and it's precisely the assumption that Lloyd's going to go ahead and critique. Um, okay, so just a couple of basic facts before we get into Lloyd's critique. Um, Basic facts about the female orgasm. Hopefully you got some of this in your prior education. But So um, one of the things that makes it in some sense an appealing target for explanation in this sense is that it's a classic reflex. So you can have an orgasm without knowing what one is. Uh, they happen largely involuntarily, very cross-culturally prevalent. So it's not just like one culture has them and another culture doesn't. They seem to be culturally universal. Um, but they're interestingly highly variable within uh, one person's life and across individuals. So um, most of the things that we think are targets of selection are present in pretty much the whole population, but that doesn't seem to be the case with the female orgasm. Um, that, that variability is pretty hard to explain, and I would argue that it's probably not related to the things that most people intuitively think it's related to. So uh, this is really interesting study from 2011 called female orgasm rates are largely independent of other traits. Um, and I just want to read you a little bit from it because they go through everything that you might intuitively think female orgasm rates are related to and they just find that they are not. So um, Analyzing a community sample of 2,914 Australian female twins, we found mostly near zero correlations between orgasm rates, and they're talking about orgasm rates during intercourse, other sexual activities, or masturbation. So not just intercourse. So, and a range of 19 other traits, including, so that they found that the 
rate of orgasm across different uh, contexts was not correlated or near zero correlation with Socioeconomic status, sexuality, personality, health traits, relationship length and status, extroversion, neuroticism, psychoticism, lifetime number of sex partners, preference for committed versus uncommitted sexual relationships, risky sexual behavior, sexual fantasy, liberalism, conservatism, restrictive attitudes towards sex, libido, educational attainment, occupational status, and others. So the rate at which an individual uh, has orgasms is unrelated to any of those things. And you can see, so in this chart, which is from this paper, uh, you can see that there's, uh, so how often do you have an orgasm during masturbation? Also relevant to Lloyd's analysis is going to be the fact that masturbation is much more likely to generate an orgasm for females than for males. Uh, what we find is that uh, there's a pretty solid percentage of women who never have orgasms. Uh, here we've got, uh, you know, 15, between 10 and 15% of women. And, uh, amongst the women who have rarely, fairly often, often, or usually we get another huge percent of the, of, of the population. So this is going to be important when thinking about evolutionary accounts of the female orgasm, because if it's something that you like really, really need in order to be able to reproduce or have high fitness, it would be bizarre that 15% of women don't have it, right? Like weird, right? Okay, so uh, with those basic data in hand, Lloyd goes through all of the theories of evolution that were available at the time. I mean, this book has been criticized, but it was everybody, including its critics, admit that she was extremely thorough at looking at the different proposed theories. Uh, so in the next video, what I'll do is go through just kind of a handful of them, not all of them, because there's a lot, uh, and show you where she thinks that this pattern of bias emerges. Okay, thanks.